Amen. There is, there is life without Christ, but it's not a satisfying life. There is life without God in your, in your life, but it won't bring you fulfillment or peace, uh, purpose, all of the things that we all desire to have and to experience. And, and you, can, you can go ahead and live a life without Christ and without God. It's totally your choice. But I want to tell you this, folks. You're missing out. You really are. And, and, a, and a life with God at the helm, a life with God in your life and leading you and guiding you and, and, and giving you the resources and the help that you're not experiencing right now, I tell you what, it's a life that is so satisfying and so full, so rich. As I said, I met Christ back when I was uh, a young man. I was 17 years of age, and that was back in 1972. So those of you that are good at math, you can figure out how many years ago that was. And uh, yeah, how old I am. <laughs> and uh, I look in the mirror this morning and uh, these days, and, I, and I, I see that guy standing back looking at me, and I think, who are you, and where did you come from, and how did you get this old? <laughs> And I know that many of you are, have, have asked the same question and say the same thing. But I want you to know that it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, with Christ in your life, you can live a victorious life. You can live a fulfilling life. It won't always be perfect. There will be tr tr troubled times and tough times. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, the world will give you trouble. Make no mistake, the world will give you trouble. But I like this. He said, but I have overcome the world. And folks, there, that old uh, song says there's victory in Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that there really is. And, and it doesn't matter how, how much pain you've experienced or how much heartache you're going through. Jesus is the answer to bring hope, peace, and joy in your life today. I, I want to read a little story. And the reason I want to read this story is because I'm a cowboy at heart. Any of you, anybody else out there? A few of you? One, two, three, four. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I know that we've also got some bikers in the crowd. Any bikers out there? <laughs> so here's a little story about Jake and the biker gang. <clears throat> cowboy Jake, he's at the pearly gates waiting to be admitted. While St. Pete is leafing through this big book to see if he's worthy to enter. St. Peter goes through the book several times, furrows his brow, and then says to Jake, Jake, I can't see that you did anything really good in your life. But yeah, I know you never did anything bad either. Tell you what, if you can tell me of one really good deed that you did in your life, you're in. Well, Jake thinks for a moment, and he says, well, what about that one time when I was driving down the highway and I saw this nasty biker gang assaulting this poor woman on the side of the road? I slowed down my truck to see what was going on, and sure enough, there they were, about 50 of them torturing this young girl. Infuriated, I got mad. I had all I could stand. I couldn't stand no more, so I got out of my truck, grabbed a tire iron, and walked straight up to the leader of the gang a huge guy with a studded leather jacket, chain running from nose to ear. As I walked up to that leader of the gang, they formed a circle around me. So I ripped that leader's chain off his face. I smashed him over the head with my tire iron. Then I turned around and I yelled to the rest of them, you leave this poor girl alone, you slime. You're all a bunch of sick, deranged animals. Go home before I teach you all a lesson in pain. Well, impressed, St. Peter says, really, Jake, when did this happen? And Jake replied, about two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a funny story, and I say that for the, my friends that are all bikers. I, I sold my bike last year. I got rid of my horse about uh, 25 years ago, but I uh, sold my bike last year, and, and uh, now I'm I'm taking it easy in retirement. I got the, my motor home on my wheels out there. I got my land yacht that, I, that uh, I live in and travel in. And I have my best friend on this planet with me. Her name is Debbie, and she's sitting there. She runs my sound and, and uh, mixes everything, makes it sound good, makes me sound good. And she's got the job that every housewife wishes they could have with their husband. 
One push of the button and she can get rid of me anytime. She <laughs> yeah, thank you, sweetheart. I love you. <laughs> God is good, folks. Even in the toughest times of our life, God is good. And I want to talk to you today about three things that Jesus took away from humanity at the cross so long ago. Now, we always hear about the good things that God has given us. But there are some things that God has taken away from us. And I want to talk about that this morning. Now, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 27, Jesus told a parable about a servant who owed his king a vast amount of money. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what a parable is, or uh, it's, a, it's, a fiction, it's a fictional or a simple story that Jesus would tell to use uh, to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. And throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus gave several uh, parables, told several stories to his disciples to help solidify a spiritual truth or a lesson that he was teaching. In this parable, the servant told his king that he would pay back every cent that he owed. And yet it was clear that he did not have the ability to do so. Did you get that? It was clear in this story that he did not have the ability to pay back that which he owed. In fact, he would never be able to do so. Jesus said these words. He said, the king felt compassion upon his servant and was willing to cancel the entire debt. The lesson found or taught in this parable was concerning a debt that could never be repaid. Friend of mine, listen to me this morning. Humanity is in that same position before God. In our own strength, humanity could not cannot and will not ever be able to make proper restitution or make right all of our wrongs, our transgressions, and our sin. But God, I love those two words throughout the Bible, but God, it means there's a change, there's something to look at, something to be excited about. It says, but God has taken pity on us and like the king in the parable, God has granted humanity, if they so choose to accept it, God has granted humanity mercy and forgiveness of our transgressions, our sin, and the holy demands of justice. Now, justice in its broadest sense is the principle that people receive that which they deserve. Being impacted upon by numerous circumstances, with many differing viewpoints and perspectives, including the concepts of moral correctness based on ethics, rationality, law, religion, equity, and fairness. Justice is, in a sense, a harmonious relationship between two warring parts, as in the case of good and evil, sin and righteousness. C.S. Lewis, he describes justice uh, as the existence, now get this, of an objective morality that implies the existence of God and vice versa. Now, in his justice, coupled with his compassion, God has granted forgiveness to humanity for our transgressions, for the debt that we owe because of sin and the nature we were born with that causes us to continue to transgress, to transgress the laws of God or the moral precepts and concepts of God. And we need to understand that when, when God granted that forgiveness, He sent Jesus on our behalf to do that work. And there's three things that Jesus took away so that you and I could experience God's forgiveness, uh, the complete fulfillment of God's forgiveness. And the first thing Jesus took away was our debt, our debt as required by the old covenant of sacrifice. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, 
there is no remission or no forgiveness of sin. And because we cannot redeem ourselves from sin, nor can we adequately pay the debt owed, God has granted compassion on us and has accepted the debt paid by Christ, therefore canceling our debt of sin. The price paid and the sacrifice made to accomplish that transaction was nothing less than the death and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his own son. The second thing Jesus took away at the cross was our sins. And this is a concept that we really need to grasp, folks, because once you do, it'll set you free. It'll take away all your worry, all your fear. Am I good enough? The price, uh, the, 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 the th- second thing Jesus took away uh, was that sin that constantly hounds us. In fact, it, it comes back and it reminds us of what we did and it continues to condemn us. Before the cross, get this folks, before the cross, all of the sacrifices of sin that were made were ineffective. Had they not foreshadowed and anticipated the death of Christ. Hebrews 9.26 says it was necessary that Christ put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once the death of Jesus took place, all the transgressions committed under the former law, under the old covenant, were taken away forever. The former sacrifices did not provide such redemption but only a temporary covering of sin, like throwing a blanket or a tarp over something to hide it from sight. The law itself and the sacrifice itself could not remove sin. The blood shed under that law only covered exposed sin. But here's another but. (laughs) Jesus took away the demands of the law When his blood was shed, his blood not only covered sin from God's sight, but his blood cleansed it and removed it forever. Psalms 103 verse 12 tells us, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Micah tells us that he put them into the bottom of the sea or the sea of forgetfulness. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 to 18 says, Their laws or their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And Isaiah 118 puts it this way. Though your skin, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Folks, let me say this this morning sitting here listening to me or on the live stream this morning. Perhaps you're not uh, one that makes church or a relationship with God a priority in your life. And you've wondered what's going to happen for your life in the future. And let me say this. If you have believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus, then as a Christian, you can be confident that when we do slip up, When we do sin, we can be secure in the promise that God is faithful to forgive us of our sins, according to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. He does not hold our sins over us. He does not hold our transgressions over us. He does not hold our mistakes over us, even though our own flesh will accuse us and condemn us, and judge us. And I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. There is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Folks, you need to know today to the the length, the degree, the, the maximum that God has gone to so that you can experience peace and forgiveness in your life. He does not hold our sins over us, Jesus' blood completely and continually, did you get that? Continually removes our sin. He frees us from the slavery of sin and sets us free to experience an abundant new life, 
a life that Jesus talked about in John chapter 10 and verse 10 when he said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and that more abundantly. Folks, here's a truth that you can take home with you this morning. If you have accepted his sin offering, namely the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross, and submitted to his lordship, then you are made acceptable in the eyes of God. Your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. And when you say to God, God, do you remember when I blew it and I did this and that? God says, nope. They're gone. And if God can forget them, folks, you can forget them. And if God can forgive you, then you need to forgive yourself. Now, the third thing he took away at the cross was the power. How many of you have experienced that in your life when you just didn't have any strength to deal with the situation that came up? It's a power that was beyond your ability to handle or take control of. The third thing that Jesus took away was the power that sin held over us. When Jesus died on the cross, he not only took away our debt, he not only took away our sin, but he also removed the things that are associated with sin, the things that give sin its power, namely the power of sin contained within the Mosaic law of commandments and its laws or the old covenant. In Romans chapter 7, verse 4 to 13, Paul explains to us how the law, the old covenant, gave sin an opportunity. The law gave sin its power, and then sin brought about death in our lives. In this passage, Paul links three things together, law, sin, and death. And you know what? Christ took them all away when he said, when he gave up the ghost on the cross, and he said, it is finished. Folks, I don't want to keep you too long, but I want you to know that there was one perfect life that was shed. You and I could never live up to the standards that the law and the old covenant wanted. You and I don't, couldn't, we didn't have a perfect life. We couldn't live a perfect life. There's no way that we can begin to experience a perfect life because we were created, we were born in sin, created in sin, all of that, that stuff. But, I love that word, but, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was born, uh, he was conceived sinless. He was born sinless. He walked through life sinless. Not once in his short time here on earth did Jesus ever yield to temptation and sin, and he came to the cross with a life lived unto perfection behind him. Not saying that he didn't consider it. Luke twenty two forty four says when he came to the cross, he was in great anguish and sorely tempted as his sweat became like great drops of blood. Even in his agony on the cross, he was tempted and taunted. If you're the Son of God, take yourself down. Come down from the cross. Matthew 26, 53 says, He could have called more than 12 legions of angels to rescue him from that cruel ordeal that he took upon himself for our benefit. And yet, according to Luke 22, verse 42, Jesus yielded to nothing except the will of his Father. And what was the Father's will? That you and I might know forgiveness and a relationship with him for eternity. Folks, when we compare ourselves to Jesus, we fall far short and realize how imperfect we are. We cannot bring to God a perfect life. And so we face rejection. We face punishment. But Jesus took away our punishment. He was punished for our sins because humanity, you and I, are imperfect because of sin. And God's holy demand for justice demands not only for perfection, but also uh, the punishment for every imperfection. Jesus took care of it all. As in the parable that I shared with you this morning, Jesus shared with his followers, and he said, The king had mercy on his servant that owed him such a great debt. And folks, God in his compassion has mercy upon you and I because we could never pay that debt that has built up because of sin over time and over life today. And you know, 2 Peter chapter 3, I love this. 
says that God is not willing that any should perish. No matter what it is that you've done or what it is you think God cannot forgive, I want you to know God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance and eternal life through his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was placed upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Folks, you need to understand, as Peter says, Christ suffered for you. He was the just. We are the unjust. Jesus himself prophesied in John 11. He said, it's better for one to die than for all to perish. Folks, this punishment that Jesus took away on the cross, this punishment, um, he, he said, greater love has no man than this, he who would lay down his life for a friend. And the acceptance of Christ's punishment on the cross as a substitute for our punishment is called justification. You don't have to justify yourself today in front of friends, neighbors, your wives, uh, your, 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 uh, your, your church, or even in front of God. God has already justified you and made you acceptable because of the work of Christ on the cross. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, Christ is our justification, our sanctification, and our redemption. But in order for something to be redeemed, a price must be paid to make that transaction legal. Jesus paid the price for our redemption. The great apostle Paul says in Romans 7, 14, I'm carnal, sold under sin. Folks, God's holiness, God's justice demands more than just perfection and punishment. It also demands retribution. Adam sold humanity over to the mastery of Satan when he sinned. God did not sell us out. We sold ourselves when we yielded to sin. Like the people of old in, in 2 Kings 17, it says they sold themselves to do evil. We can only be transformed from Satan's ownership to God's ownership upon payment of the proper price. Not by your good works not by works of righteousness that you slave to do. We can only be transferred because of the price that Christ paid in his blood to buy us back from the mastery of sin and Satan. Folks, you need to understand today that condemnation has been taken away and you have been given freedom and forgiveness today. Jesus said this, this is the condemnation that men chose darkness and reject the light. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the light of the world. Humanity became Satan's possession when Adam chose to sin. And when we continually reject the light and choose darkness, then we choose the same reward that is reserved for Satan uh, throughout eternity. Hebrews 11.25 says, We sold ourselves for a price the pleasures of sin for a season. We do not have what we need or what is needed to buy back our freedom because of our own imperfection. And there's no realistic answer to the question, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When we choose darkness, we sell ourselves out for a fool's price. And we can't blame God for this mess. We are the offenders. God is the offended. Our only hope would be to find someone able to pay a price in exchange for our choices, our transgressions, and our acts of disobedience. And you know what? That's not as hopeless as it sounds because there is such a one. I sang it earlier. Jesus is the answer. It is Jesus and the price he paid with his blood his pure, untainted, and sinless blood. Only those who belong to Satan face the eternal punishment prepared for Satan. You and I, whom believe in Christ, whom choose to follow Christ, have been set free from the law of sin and death. And thus the severity of God fell upon Jesus, 
and the goodness of God falls upon you and I. You have been bought with a price, folks. A free gift via the king's compassion and mercy. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Grace, God's gift, God's goodness is what brings you to saving faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast about it or try to take credit for it. As followers of Christ, as believers, as children of God, our only responsibility, our only debt to fulfill or works necessary is to exercise faith in Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled all that justice, holiness, and the law demanded by his own sacrificial death. Once again, Hebrews 9.15 tells us that through the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us all, who have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we share in the inheritance of Christ and enjoy a permanent, unbroken relationship with God because Jesus took away the debt of sin. Jesus took away sin. Jesus took away the power of sin. Friend, I'd like you to bow your heads right now, if you would, please. Those of you that are watching on the live stream, I invite you to do the same. I'm not out to embarrass anybody, manipulate you into doing something that you don't want to do. But let me say this. We're living in a world today that is challenging us in every aspect of our life, whether it's good or whether it's evil. The challenge is so very real, and it's beyond our ability. We're like the Apostle Paul who said in Romans chapter 7, why is it the things that I don't want to do, I do? And the things that I want to do, I just can't seem to do. We're facing that in our world today. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is here, folks, this morning. He's here to touch your heart. He's here to... To, to bring you that peace that passes all understanding that he said he would give unto us. Folks, you need to understand it today. God loves you. And the only thing that affects you experiencing the fulfillment of that love is your choice. And, and I just want to ask you today, as you've listened to the songs I've sung, they're, they're, they're not meant for the elitist. They're meant for the men on the street. You, who are living life and looking for answers. Jesus is that answer. And so I'm wondering today, would you like to accept his sacrifice on your behalf? You can do that right now. It's a very simple act of faith. All it takes is for you to in your heart of hearts, say, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you died to take my sin away. I believe that you died to make me acceptable in the eyes of God. And folks, you can experience that as of this moment, if in your heart of hearts you will say, come in, Lord Jesus. I want to pray for you right now with your head bowed. Father, it's in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, that I pray for this wonderful group of people that have been so patient with me this morning. For those that are on the live stream watching, whether it be at this point in time or whether it be tomorrow or sometime during the week, I want to pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would touch their heart, that your Holy Spirit will bring revelation, revealed knowledge. Folks, that, that, that these folks, God, would, would understand your great love. And I ask, Father, right now that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would come into this room and like a, like a gentle wind, a gentle breeze, just begin to let your love flow across the hearts of each of these that are listening, across the hearts of those that are listening on the live stream. Father, may they experience the peace of God that passes all understanding today because they have believed upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. Now, folks, I don't claim to have any spiritual revelation knowledge or anything like that. But I know that there are some of you, I, I can feel it, there are some of you that, that need, you need the touch of God in your life today. And so Pastor Clint has told me that he has people that are ready that would take some time for you this morning and pray with you and help you to, to, to break through, to touch the hem of his garment and to really experience um, a, a touch of his love today. Pastor Clint, would you come on up here? Thank you so much, folks, for letting me uh, try to uh, share with you the goodness of God today. Uh, I hope that uh, you have experienced it. I hope that I've been able to unlock some things to help you uh, enjoy the goodness of God in the future. And uh, I really look forward to the future working with you folks to try to reach out into your community to, to let others know that, that don't go to church, to let others know about the great goodness of God. Thank you so much. God be with each and every one of you. Pastor Clint. Thank you, brother. Let's just bow in a word of prayer in closing today. Jesus, we just thank you and we give you praise for all that you are. Lord, you are our Savior and you are our Lord. And we just, we worship you this morning. And we ask God that this message that we've heard from our brother would just penetrate our hearts. And God, I know that there's people that struggle um, with condemnation that maybe you're here today or are listening to this um, this broadcast too. God, I just pray that they would they would just let go, let go of the bottom and let you take them, Lord, and, and to, to free them from that, Lord, and that they would serve you, God, and obey you, Lord. And Father, we thank you that the provisions that are given through your spirit, God, set us free to serve you and to worship you and to to live a life that is pleasing to you and obey you. God, so many times as human beings, we try to do it in our own strength. But God, we need you. We need you, Spirit of the living God. Would you just minister to the people here today as they go through their week, God? I, I just pray your blessing would be upon them. That may your grace and peace be multiplied unto them today, Lord. And we just thank you for the day that you have made and for this wonderful time we've had here this morning together. And we praise you in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you and have a wonderful day.